Hello, and welcome to the STEMC Studio channel. In this video, I'm announcing a new series of videos that I'm calling Geometric Algebra in STEMC Studio. Geometric Algebra, if you've never heard of it, is just probably one of the most fascinating mathematical tools that I have come across. And by all account, people like David Hestonies and Anthony Lazenby are saying this is basically the 21st century mathematics for physics. Now, if you've never heard of geometric algebra, you can be forgiven because it's only been around for a couple of hundred years. Yeah, you heard that right. It has been around for a couple of hundred years. And why it is not part of our current curriculum is probably a subject um, for historians um, and politicians. But we're going to put that all aside and we're going to, in this video, just I want to just give you a feel for what geometric algebra is all about and then tell you what this course is going to be all about. Geometric algebra is the idea that all physical quantities have a geometric object that can be associated with them. So, for example, mass, charge, force angular momentum, linear momentum, all of these have an associated mathematical object. And these mathematical objects can be combined with operators. That is, we, we can have A times B or A wedge B. The operator goes in the middle. We can combine all of these kind of quantities with operators to construct geometrical statements. Furthermore, geometric algebra um, opens the possibility of these geometric objects, or, uh, which kind of comprise geometric numbers. Um, it opens the possibility for those to have a geometric and intuitive geometric representation. So with this diagram here, here, <laughs> let me uh, give you um, an idea of what I mean by that. So this is three dimensional space. And as you know, things like velocity and momentum are represented by vectors mathematically. And in a visual representation or a geometric representation, we represent those by arrows. Okay, so the word vector comes from the French vector and it means to carry or to transport. You may have heard it in connection with things like malaria, the mosquito being the vector. Well, that's kind of what we mean by a vector. It's kind of like something that moves something from one place to another. But geometric algebra opens the possibility that vectors aren't really the only objects that are in our interest. And I've tried to illustrate that in this um, animation here um, by these paddles. OK, so the paddle is a new kind of object, one at least that we don't kind of conventionally um, encounter, uh, certainly in education. But it is a very appropriate object for representing things like torques, angular momentums, angular velocity. And as we will see, it actually is the correct representation for the electromagnetic field. Or at least it's a much more appropriate way to model the electromagnetic field than the way that we do it now, using the electric field being a vector and the magnetic field being a vector. Now, these two quantities that I've just shown you, this paddle rotating and the arrow, may not seem to have very much in common, but in fact, they actually do have some three common properties. And I'm going to tell you what they are, because then we can relate it to two other geometric objects in this diagram. So the properties that they have in common are magnitude, which is some measure of their size. So for example, the vector is the length of the arrow. For this rotating object, this paddle, the, the corresponding magnitude is really some kind of an area measure. So there's no specific area that we should assign to this. It's not a square, it's not a circle, but it is just an area. So that's magnitude. Another quantity is called the aspect, and this is to do with the sort of degree of freedom dimensions that this thing operates in, for want of a better word. So here, this vector here, 
lies along a line. So that's a one-dimensional object, right? You can par parameterize it with a single parameter that tells you where you are on the line. And in this quantity, this paddle, we actually have a plane. Okay, so this is a, this is a plane. So this is really like a two-dimensional object. Now, I should just add here that the conventional way to think about angular momenta um, and angular velocities is to use something that you might call the right-hand rule, or, or you know, depending on uh, the situation, you might be using a left-hand rule. So you can imagine grabbing this white arrow here, say with your right hand, and your fingers would, would um, give the direction of rotation of this. Well, that works in 3D, which is what we're in here, but it doesn't work so well in 2D because in 2D, in, in the plane itself, there is no third dimension that you can work with. Okay, so we really find that this idea of a rotating kind of plane or spinning plane is much more um, uh, generalizable to other dimensions. So for example, as we move to higher dimensions, maybe four dimensions, the direction here would be ambig ambiguous and you wouldn't be able to just put your hand or your fingers on this direction of rotation and point to like a, a, a unique perpendicular. So we've dealt with magnitude, uh, which is the length here, the area here. We dealt with aspect, which is this is one dimensional arrow. This is a two dimensional plane. And then there's one other um, property which these have in common, which is something we call orientation. So for example, here we have a line with the vector and this arrow is pointing to the right. Well, it could point to the left. So the orientation is basically like a plus or minus. Similarly for this rotating object, um, it's um, maybe you know plus in this direction and minus in the other direction. Okay, now what about things like mass and charge and things like that? These are things we call scalar quantities. And scalar quantities, you know, we're, all, we're always told, you know, that scalar quantities don't have direction, right? They have a magnitude, okay, but they don't have direction. Now, the word direction, you know, it's an un unfortunate sort of choice of word in the English language, and it doesn't really fit very well. But it actually turns out that um, scalars actually have a lot more in, quant in common with the vector and this spinning paddle um, than you might imagine. So what we represent a, um, a scalar by is essentially a point because that kind of doesn't have a, a direction, right? Um, but it also still has a magnitude, right? Because, I mean, it's just a number, okay? So so the mass, you know, it might have a certain, certain numerical value. That's the magnitude. Does it have an aspect? Recall the aspect is kind of like the dimensionality, and the line here is one-dimensional. A plane here, this rotating, that's two-dimensional. So a point, which is like, you know, a scale is kind of like a point, this is actually zero-dimensional, okay? So actually, scalars in some ways, you know, they're, they're quite similar in, in the, the way that they share these two properties. They also share an orientation. They can be positive, they can be negative, okay? So actually a scalar and a vector and this rotating paddle here, so the arrow and the rotating paddle, they actually can all be described by the same set of properties. Now, it doesn't stop there. In three dimensions, there's another quantity that um, we can have. And I've tried to represent it by this wire cube, which is kind of like a volume element, okay? So let's see if we can kind of guess, you know, what the uh, what the three properties are of this volume element. Well, the magnitude, hmm, I've given it away, it's the volume itself. Okay, what's the aspect, like the sort of number of dimensions in here? Well, it's kind of three-dimensional, it's filling the whole of space. Okay, so that's the sort of space that it occupies. And what's its orient, and does it have two orientations like everything else? Well, I'll leave you to actually imagine this, you know, maybe you maybe you kind of create little models at home, but imagine you have a piece of wire that goes from this corner of the cube up to this corner, the opposite corner of the cube. How many different shapes of wire do you need to get from that corner to this corner, to the opposite corner? And you can kind of like go many different ways, right? But how many shapes of wire do you have? 
I'll uh, you know let you guess what the answer might be. Okay, so that's the sort of intuitive idea of what geometric algebra is. It's a way of assigning mathematical objects to to the physical quantities, connecting them all with operators. And there are many interesting operators. We have obviously addition and subtraction, but we get into multiplication. We can multiply these things together. Uh, we can pull, in, in a sense, to factorize out, pull out, um, say we could pull out an arrow out of one of these, believe it or not, and we'd be left with another arrow. That's not surprising, right? This is a one-dimensional object. This is a two-dimensional object. And if we pull an arrow out of this thing, then maybe we're left with another arrow. It's kind of like a subtraction. Similarly, we can take two arrows here and we can perform an operation on them, which we call the exterior product, and that actually constructs, for example, one of these kind of like paddles. The official name for this paddle in the mathematical sense is that it's a bivector because it's made of two vectors. This big cube object is a trivector because we think of it as being made up of three vectors. Not three vectors added together, like this vector plus this vector plus this vector. No, they're not added together. They're actually multiplied together. And that's really the, in a sense, where the word geometric algebra gets its sort of geometric from. Um, it's called the geometric product, which is the pro when you when you multiply vectors together. And the algebra kind of comes from the idea that we have elements that we can multiply together using operators. So the goal in the course will be really as follows. We want to create um, an introduction to geometric algebra, which is computational. So you're able to use visualizations to help uh, build your intuition. But you will build your own geometric numbers, as they call them. And you will give them also um, operators so that they can be kind of combined into these physical laws. And then we'll demonstrate how we can use those um, in various applications. So there's obviously a lot of theory that can go along with this, but I will make the course self-contained so it won't be necessary to um, quote um, you know, textbooks and, and things like that. Um, and most of it, the proof will be kind of in the pudding of, of you know, what, what kind of like works. Uh, we'll start pretty simple. We'll start in 2D and we'll do the geometric algebra of what we call the plane. And then from there, we can go in many different directions. Um, we can add a dimension and go to three spatial dimensions. We could add, um, we, instead, of, instead of just staying with spatial dimensions, we could add time dimensions, and that could take us into something called special relativity. And uh, so we could do that by going from two spatial dimensions to one spatial plus one, one time or we could go from two spatial dimensions to two plus one time. And in fact, that's probably the best place to go because it's a good compromise. We can visualize it because we have a total of three dimensions, um, but also we can get to see most of the interesting effects. So for example, in two plus one space time, that is two space dimensions, one time dimension, we'll learn that you can only have a magnetic field with one component, um, but you can have two electric field components. So that should kind of automatically dispel the idea that um, in electromagnetism, uh, the way we're currently dis uh, describing our ele electric and magnetic fields using vectors is not correct. Um, how can a magnetic field uh, in two dimensions, only have one component and be a vector. So that's the program. We, um, we're basically going to um, compute our way through geometric algebra, adding complexity as we go. And in the process, we'll learn how to do these various things in STEMC Studio. I hope you found this interesting. Uh, if you like this video and you're looking forward to the uh, to the upcoming series, please hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified. And if you like this video itself, 
um, please hit the like button and uh, tell your friends about it. Uh, so these videos will be coming along very shortly, probably at a fairly rapid pace. So I look forward to seeing you there. Take care.